Okay, let's close our eyes. Just ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you for this day and thank you, Lord, you're leading us into all truth. Your Holy Spirit is guiding us into all truth. We just want to thank you each day of our lives through your word, through what we hear and through what we see, you're always teaching us. And even now, Lord, as I share from your word that you will help us to understand and help us to walk according to your word, Lord. Just commit each one of us into your hands under the blood of Jesus. Lord, have your way in our lives. Have your way in our lives. Even now, have your way, Lord, that you will speak to each person at the point of their need, Father. Even though the words might be of a different topic wherever they are, Father, whatever place in their lives might, they might be, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will touch them, Father. Just give you total control of this next few moments, God, till the end of this service, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will have total liberty to move, Lord. Just commit my thoughts and everything into your hands that you will grant me the grace to communicate clearly, Lord. We thank you for the blood of your son Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross. We apply the blood of Jesus in this place, Lord. Sanctify this place. Sanctify our hearts, God. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This message will be very useful for you. So if you're taking down notes, you can take down notes. Sometime back I was just pondering on some things that were going on and uh, I was praying on those things and uh, out of it came this message. The title of my message is How to Bring Correction When People Are Wrong. It might be a different kind of a title but uh, it will be very, very helpful as we look into some truths from God's word regarding that. How to bring correction in people when they are wrong. Correcting is something that we do or come across in our everyday life, whether we know it or not, knowingly or unknowingly, we come across situations where we need to address things, we come across situations where we need to correct people uh, when they are wrong and we are doing it without our knowledge or with our knowledge, we are always doing that. For example, if you are a father, parents and you have kids, I mean in a day probably you correct them twice or thrice, or, you know, in the course of the week, you know, you would have corrected them several times. If you have friends and uh, one of your friends is doing something wrong, you have a piece of advice for them, what is that? That is also correction or between husband and wives, pastor, congregation. Every aspect you see that, you know, we come across situations where we need to correct people. And uh, the important point that I want to make here is, and that's what we are going to see uh, as we as the message proceeds when we bring correction within the biblical guidelines when we have the biblical guidelines as foundation and we bring correction in people then definitely God is going to work through that amen and that's what we're going to see for example if you take the example of David <clears throat> David was a powerful king he had so many sons and daughters and I want to highlight on three, three kids that he had. One was Amon, another was Absalom and another was Tamar. Right, Tamar, the last one was David's daughter. And so what happens is during the course of life, one of the sons likes one of David's daughters and so he just basically rapes her. He does something really bad. Amon rapes Tamar. So, the word of God says in 2 Samuel 13, 21, if you can read that, 2 Samuel 13, 21, David hears about it. David hears what his son has done and look at David's reaction. Yes, when David heard of all these things, he was very angry. He was wroth, the word of God says. That is the right word used there. So David was very angry with his son, but the word of God does not mention any action that David took. 
Basically, David was really angry with his son, but he did not do anything to correct him. Amen? So here, his son, he'd done something terribly wrong. David was very angry, and he, but you know, he, he didn't channel that anger properly. He didn't correct his son. And so what happens is the years go by. Tama's brother Absalom is waiting for a chance. And so chance he gets a chance and basically what he does is he ends up killing his own brother Ammon. And so this happens, you know, Absalom kills his own brother. And then what happens is he runs away. He runs away to another country. He lives with another king. And David for three years doesn't do anything about it. The word of God says, if you would continue reading those chapters, the word of God says, at one point, you know, David's heart starts longing for his son, but yet David does not do anything about it. And then after three years in exile, after three years of not seeing his son, because of some of the people around David, they bring his son back. And Look at David's response to Samuel 14, 24. We're looking at all of these things in the context of correcting and how important it is to correct uh, when people are wrong. 2 Samuel 14, 24. After three years, his son is being brought back and look at David's response. Let him not see my face. Yes, that will do sister, yeah. So you see here, David hasn't seen his son, hasn't talked with his son for three years. His heart is longing for his son, so people around him, you know, uh, talk to him and bring his son. And the moment his son comes, what does he say? I don't want to see your face, get out. That's what he basically says. And for two years, two years, so it's totally five years now, David has not talked with his son. And do you know what happens during these five years? The enemy starts sowing his seed in Absalom. Absalom grows up to be a rebel, rises against his own dad, and then, you know, tries to kill his own dad. So there's a lot of things we can learn from here. In the first instance, David didn't bring correction and therefore Absalom, his son, took it upon himself to correct his own brother. In the second instance, David just basically overreacts and doesn't see his son for five years and when his, when his son comes after three years, you know, David says, you know, don't even look at my face, just get out. And because of that, because David didn't know how to handle things in his family, he did not know how to correct, he basically didn't bring correction where correction was needed, and then he brought correction in a reactive way. Because of that, David had to face problems. And you can write this down. This is a wisdom key, and it will apply in many situations. When you don't bring correction, to those under your authority and those under your influence, then someone else from outside will. When you don't take responsibility and bring correction, someone else on the outside will do that. For example, you parents, you have ch kids, and one of the kids has a problem, attitude problem. If you don't correct your kids, who's going to do that? probably a wild principal in the school <laughs> or a wild teacher in the school ending up beating your child really bad. Amen? You get that? Or you bring correction the wrong way, you overreact and you bring correction the wrong way, you're going to make a lot of enemies. Amen? That's what happened to David. The way he corrected Absalom for his mistake wasn't right. Of course, what his son did was wrong, but not to speak to him for five years, not banishing for three years, and at the end of three years, here is his 
son coming to meet him and he says, you know, don't even come near me, don't look at my face, just get out. And for two full years doesn't see his son. Basically he was just overreacting. And as a result, during those times what happens is, as I said earlier, you know, the enemy sow, sowed his seed into Absalom and Absalom ends up rising against his own dad. So if you are in a place of authority and you overreact and you bring correction the wrong way, it is going to boomerang, it is going to affect you at some point. Amen? So bringing correction the right way is very, very important. So what are the proper guidelines, the biblical guidelines for bringing correction? You guys are ready for this? Amen? This will be very, very helpful for you. Number one, maintain your respect for the person you are correcting. This is very important. Maintain your respect for the person you are correcting. A lot of times we don't do that, do we? When we are angry, we are really angry. <laughs> we blow the lid. <laughs> Right? Any correction that does not come out of respecting an individual and valuing them is wrong. I like to repeat that once again. Any correction that does not come out of respecting an individual and valuing them is wrong. You look at so many kids in families or young people or even older people. Because parents didn't correct them the right way, years down their lives they still are broken, they still have wounds and they still have hurts and they still have longings, dearly beloved. This is so, so important. If the parent or a person in authority had cared to respect them while correcting them, things would have been really, really different. And there's a couple of points I'd like to make here so that, you know, we understand this. So that to bring some perspective into this so that we understand, you know, why we need to respect people. Number one, even if they are non-believers, the word of God says that all of us are made in the image of God, right? So there's a certain amount of respect that we need to give. James chapter 3 verses 9, look at what it says. How many of you know what James chapter 3 is about? James chapter 3 is about the tongue, right? The tongue is a little instrument but it sets big forests on fire. <laughs> and you know we need to learn to control our tongue. Hold our tongue. I said this in the morning service earlier. Some people's tongue are as long as from here to Marina Beach. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to the topic here. Yes, read James chapter 3 verses 9. Yes, if somebody can read it loudly. The tongue we praise our God and Father, with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Basically what he's saying is doing that, talking ill about others is not right. That's what, you know, James is trying to say here. And Jesus also goes on to say, you know, if you Without cause, if you abuse your brother, say something against your brother, there is punishment for that. So basically we need to learn to respect people for who they are. Especially if they are believers and especially if they are children of God. Amen? Just take a good look at the person next to you. Come on, do that. The person next to you is a child of God. Amen? Hallelujah! And God values each one of His children. God sees each one of us as precious. And that is the same mindset that needs to come inside even of us, dearly beloved. 
as we relate to one another. There's a lot of truths here that I can go on, but I'd like to mention something very important. People say this, you have to earn my respect. Have you heard people say that? Well, if they do the right things and, you know, say the right things, then they have my respect. Like I'll, I'll agree to some parts of that, but I'd like to make a statement here. Is that the way God loved us? Is that the way He chose to display His love for us? Because we were right, because we did everything right, because we were worthy of respect, is that, I mean, the reason why Jesus came to this earth and died for us? Because we were doing 99 things that were right and there's one little thing, you know, that we were missing. Therefore, Jesus came, said, okay, you know, I need to help you in this one thing. So that's why I've come down to this earth. Am I making my point here? You see, even when we were sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. None of us deserved salvation. None of us deserved anything. But in spite of our state, Christ valued us. Christ valued you and me. He loved you and me. He saw you and me as something precious. And He gave His life for you and me. By the way, Unless you respect somebody, unless you value somebody, you're not going to give your life for them. Right or wrong? You're not going to die for them unless you value somebody. And Christ did that. He respected us. He valued us even when we were doing everything wrong. Amen? So what is my point here? <laughs> My point here is respect doesn't necessarily have to come from doing everything right. Amen? If God chose to do that, none of us would be sitting here. Probably we'll all be scratching our flesh, you know, burning in hell. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. If God chose to, you know, wait for us to change, wait for us to earn His respect, we wouldn't be here daily, beloved. So we need to develop that mindset inside us. You see, when Saul was doing a lot of wrong things, I wanted you to understand something. He was a king who was demon-possessed at times. Could you believe it? Demon-possessed king. He was ranting and raving at times. And he was doing everything possible to kill people. As a matter of fact, he killed, Saul killed most of God's priests. So they're killing all the pastors in Chennai. How do you like that? But yet, when Saul and David, you know, Saul is chasing David, chasing David like a dog, really. And David is running in the deserts. And when David gets a chance to respond back, gets a chance to respond back and take Saul's life, how does David respond? It's hard for us, come on. It's hard for us to say it. How does he respond? He is the Lord's anointed. He is the Lord's anointed. I will not do anything against him. In one place, David ends up taking a part of Saul's, you know, dress. And even doing that, his conscience smites him. He apologizes to Saul for doing that. So are you seeing this daily beloved? Amen? We should respect people for who they are, for who God has made them to be. Amen? And you know, whether they are right or wrong, that is secondary. And that's the way God saw us and that's the way God chose to love us and that's the way we also need to do that to people around us. And this is so important because if we start doing that, people around us will start changing. And I made a, made a point here that we are all God's children. Amen? Today, in the worldly um, setting that we are growing in, we've developed mindsets to respect people according to their position and according to their status, right? If a guy with a big tie and coat 
and a Mercedes Benz comes driving up your doorway and you know, you're all there, you know, looking after him. And I use the example of, you know, how people here are received in church. I'm not sure if that happens. Let's say a guy drives up in a car and says, I want to talk to the pastor. He's wearing a coat and a suit, comes up driving in a car, AZ car. I want to see the pastor. And people are like, oh, wait, 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 let me call the pastor. Let me see if the pastor is here. And so there's call after call. Pastor Divian is not reachable, so they try calling Pastor Dylan. And then they somehow, you know, get in touch with us and they, you know, make sure that we meet the guy. And then after that, an old lady comes with a stick. She's 85 years old, clothes torn. There's nobody to look after her. Can I meet the pastor? Lady, there's Sundays and there's Wednesdays. Please find time during that time to come and meet the pastor. So what are we doing here? We're showing partiality, isn't it? Without, without even knowing, we've developed mindsets and we are partial to people. I'm not saying we need to, we shouldn't respect people's position. <laughs> we need to do that, but on the other hand, we need to respect people because they are made in the image of God and secondly, because they are children of God. Amen? If somebody is born in the, in the kingdom of God, no matter how wrong they might be, they are a child of God. And we need to learn to respect people according to who they are in God, in God's kingdom. You see, I like to, you know, differentiate this to help you understand with an example. Let's say I have three kids, just an example. I just have two right now and we're not expecting another kid, okay? So, let's say I have three kids, all three daughters. The first one, you know, ends up studying to be a doctor. The second ends up being the president of the United States and she has the right to do that. And my third daughter, she's a staff nurse in SP hospital, okay? So that you understand. You know where SP hospital is? So these three children of mine, they are in different positions and these positions are very important. But when they come home to see their daddy or mommy, when my second daughter comes, would this be the way I would respond? Oh, Madam President, please come. Please take a seat, Madam President. What do you want, Madam President? Is that the way I would respond? Come here, you. <laughs> Wouldn't I do that? <laughs> and hug my daughter, even though she is, she might be the President of the United States, it doesn't matter to me. I would show them equal love and equal respect because they are my children. Amen? And we need to understand this. Whether it be a person in the highest of positions or a beggar walking in the streets. If they are in Christ, they are all God's children and God sees them equally. Amen? Can we clap to the Lord? <laughs> Whether you are an apostle, prophet, or a lady cleaning the church, when you go before God, you know, God sees you equally. God sees everyone equally. And that is the mindset that we need to develop to respect people. Amen? That they are all children of God. Now turn to the person next to you and have a good look at them. Who are they? Good for nothing loafer. <laughs> <laughs> our, wo <laughs> our words, you know, show whether we have respect or not, really. The words that we use. When we respect somebody, we don't use words like good for nothing, waste. 
I don't know why I gave birth to you. Come on now, am I stepping on some toes today? You respect your child and you bring correction to your child, respecting them as an individual and God will work dearly beloved, amen? A lot of times we bring correction in such a way that we end up damaging instead of helping people really. And one of the reasons being is because we don't respect people while bringing correction. When my daughter Amy was six or five years old, she said something and I told her, what you said was wrong. And she said, when she was around five years old, no, what I said wasn't wrong. And I told her, you thought like this and you said like this, therefore it is wrong. And she responded, I didn't think like that and I didn't say like that, so I'm not wrong. And this went back and forth and finally my daughter said, how do you know me, daddy? I am I and you are you. Has a famous dialogue. She said, I am I and you are you. You do not know me. You do not know my thoughts, she said. Then after that I kept quiet. And out of that I learned something very important. Five-year-old, I thought, ah, five-year-old. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, even if she's a five-year-old, I need to show her some respect. Amen? And if we can learn to do that, I mean, there are two extremes to that, right? You need to show honor to your children, love your children, respect your children. And then, you know, there are people who don't do that. And then there are people who are at the other end also, having their kids on their heads. Now, there's a balance to that. But if we can bring correction with respect in our children's lives, it will help them instead of hurting them. You guys are here? Secondly, Romans chapter 2 verses 4. Romans chapter 2 verses 4. James? James, can you more? Romans chapter 2 verses 4. Somebody read it. It's God's kindness that leads to repentance. Knowing that it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. Everybody say that. It's God's kindness that leads to repentance. As believers, as children of God, why are we sitting here? It's because God chose to be kind. God sent His only Son when we were sinners. Jesus gave His own life for us. He loved us. He hung naked on the cross for you and me. And it is that kindness, it is that love that brings us to repentance. Amen? Hallelujah. It's looking at God's goodness and how kind He's been and how much He loved us. It's the, that which brings repentance in us daily, beloved. And it's that which is going to bring repentance in people when they are wrong. You need to be kind to people while correcting them. You need to love the people whom you're correcting. Amen? That's my next point. My first point is respect people while correcting. Secondly, secondly, you need to love the people whom you're correcting. I want you to look at an instance in the Word of God in Luke chapter 5. Peter and a few of the disciples are fishing throughout the night and you know they, they, they don't catch anything and then Jesus comes by and Jesus says, put your nets on the other side deep in the ocean and they end up catching a lot of fish. Look at what happens in verses 8 and 9. Somebody read verses 8 and 9.
What does it say? When Simon Peter was convicted by Jesus, when Jesus told Simon Peter, you've done this and this and this, you're wrong, he fell on his knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful person. Is that what the word of God says? When Simon Peter saw what? Saw what Jesus had done. Saw Jesus' goodness. Amen? When Simon Peter saw that, it brought a conviction inside him that he was a sinner. Hallelujah. What's the point that I'm trying to make here? It's being kind to people when they are wrong is what brings conviction inside them. As a matter of fact, sometimes you don't need to even correct people. When they are wrong, if you just show them love, God will bring conviction in their lives. And this is so, so important. We sometimes try to correct people, correct, correct people, and in the end, they end up being harder than before, simply because we don't follow simple truths while correcting people. If you, by the biblical precedent, if you bring correction, if you walk that way, the Holy Spirit will work in people's hearts. What is one of the important works of the Holy Spirit? Is to convict the world of sin. Is the Holy Spirit who convicts a person of sin. Whether it be a believer or who in Christ, when we do something wrong, who is the one who brings conviction? It's the Holy Spirit. And for Him to convict people of their wrong and bring them to repentance, we can do some things basically right. He's going to have the platform to do that. Amen? When we out of love bring correction in people, definitely it will help them. They will listen. They will repent. When people know, when the people you are correcting, they know that you love them and you are genuinely interested in their lives, then they will trust you when you bring correction in their lives. Amen? It is so, so true, dearly beloved. I can give several examples. One such example was, and we've learned a lot having Bible students from Rajasthan and Orissa and all of these places, they come from difficult backgrounds. And so our patience was tested to the limit a lot of times. So we learned a lot just being with them and training them and growing with them really. And you need to understand something, I'd like to give you a background. When we are taking these students, we pay for their travel, we pay for their food, we pay for everything, we bring them here. And we also pay for all of their studies, everything, we do everything for them. Simply because of the situations that you are living in, they, they can't afford anything. And so there were these two guys who would come. And basically the first week of being here, they were like, we want to go back home. And we advise them and advise them and advise them, no, we want to go back home, we want to go back home, we want to go back home. That's what they were saying the whole time. And there was a choice I had to make really. I could be angry with them and just say, you know, buy your own tickets and get out of here. You guys are not fit for Bible college, not fit for ministry, not fit for anything, get out. I could have been angry and done that. But during that time, God gave us so much of love. And you know what we did? We paid for their tickets, we gave them food. And I hugged them and I told them, you know what? The decision that you're making isn't right. But I believe God is a God of many chances. And I want to bless you and pray for you before you leave. Probably even if you go somewhere else, our prayers are that you fulfill God's will for your life. And we just loved them and we sent them from here. They went back, they were so convicted, they came back again in a couple of weeks. Amen? Yes. They didn't come back Two of them, they brought one of their friends also to the Bible college to study. Today, they're doing ministry, they're in the ministry and they're doing well in the Lord. 
The last time when we were there, I asked one of them, how many people do you minister to? He said, around hundred. And another guy who'd left, within the first few months, he was able to get forty people into God's kingdom. Forty people. Nearly fifteen people when I was there, I was able to baptize them. Amen? Do you imagine what would have happened if we would have just sent them away? <laughs> Probably, you know, God is merciful. But then, you know, to the extent that they're bearing fruit right now, it would have never happened. And that was because we chose to love them. I mean, loving is not like overlooking mistakes, right? You can love people and be also firm at the same time. I'd like to tell you another story also of a student. Basically, he, we put him in a certain place and he did not listen to us. He was very rebellious and uh, he just came from that place. We followed the same principle with him. We loved him, showed him love. We sent him back to his own home, home place and he said, after some time he said, I want to join your ministry. I told him, you go back to the place I sent you, you can join. <laughs> In a nice way, I wasn't angry. <laughs> I mean, we can love people and yet be firm daily beloved, amen? A lot of times what happens is we end up holding anger and you know, all of these things inside us and it just grows and grows and grows till, you know, we just end up doing a lot of wrong things and saying a lot of wrong things. If I correct the students, it stays with me for that day. And if it is bothering me, I will go to the Lord and I will ask the Lord, Lord, remove it from my heart. A lot of times when we are offended or when situations happen, Basically, we allow it to grow. What does the word of God say in Ephesians? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the sun go down. Probably few of you are thinking, maybe I should relocate to Finland or St. Petersburg, one of these places where the sun doesn't go down at all for a couple of months. <laughs> no. God was trying to make a point that you need to let go of things immediately. And we don't do that. We are like a car that needs oil change and the oil hasn't been changed for so many years, really. <laughs> and we are running on, you know, greasy oil. <laughs> but on that day, if something happens on that day, let go of it. It will help you daily, beloved. Amen. Hallelujah. Do we have time for one more or you guys? It's close to eight o'clock. You guys ready for one more? Yes. You can write the third point down. Be constructive in your approach. Criticism needs to be constructive criticism not destructive criticism. Amen? A lot of us, I think, are on the latter side. We are destructive with our criticism, really. When you point out people's mistakes, you need to know that you're pointing it out to help them. Why are we pointing people's mistakes? Pointing it out to help people with their best intentions in mind. So our approach should be constructive. Yes, there are people who have wrong mindsets. A lot of times, we end up tearing the wrong mindsets and tearing the person also. 
you need to, okay, you need to break down those wrong mindsets, but, but you know, in the process you need to have the attitude of helping people and building people up, dearly beloved. Why are there so many people with hurts today? It's because somewhere down the line, family member or a parent or a person in authority brought correction the wrong way in their lives, didn't bring correction at all or brought correction in an abusive way. And that's why there are so many hurting people even today. Be constructive in your approach. If you would go through Jesus' address to the seven churches, and I want you to go and read this at home. This is very, very important. You know how Jesus approaches the seven churches? First, he starts by a revelation of himself, and then he starts by appreciating the churches. Before criticizing the churches, he starts by appreciating the churches. Only one church he just criticizes from the beginning till the end. <laughs> but even there he says to him who overcomes, you're going to be rewarded. But if you would look at Jesus' approach to the churches, first he appreciates them for their good works. He appreciates the good things that they had done. And then he tells them, these are the mistakes. If you do these things, this is what is going to happen. But if you overcome if you correct your mistakes, you are going to be rewarded. Amen? And that is the approach that we need to use when we are correcting people. Most of us go into the second phase immediately, <laughs> just correcting people. And then, you know, you're, you're not going to amount anything in life, that's it, you're done, blah, 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 blah. And the list goes on and on and on. So what do we do? Instead of helping people, <laughs> we just tear them apart really. Amen? Please read Revelations where Jesus brings correction to the churches. Please read it at home. It will be very, very helpful for you. And we were taught to do this in the Bible college that we studied. We were taught to do this. Any meeting, we would have to critique that meeting. And the way we did it was, we wrote five good points about the meeting and also five things that needed to be improved upon. And one of the things I learned through my school was, a lot of things God taught, how to be constructive in your approach, not destructive. Amen? I just want us to examine our lives today. I'd like to read a few verses, if, um, if sister can come and read these verses in the mic, I think that will be really good. We're just going to go through a couple of verses because the words we speak are very, very important. The words we speak can damage people and we're going to see some verses from the Bible, Psalm 64. If uh, we can use this mic. Yes. Psalm 64, 2 to 4. What does David liken words to here? Swords and deadly arrows. Just looking at people, I think there's some arrows sticking out of you. <laughs> deadly arrows, swords piercing you. Words are like swords, words are like arrows, really. We need to be careful how we speak and what we speak. Yes, Proverbs chapter 12, verses 18. I'll just go through them, sister, thanks. I, there's a lot of verses. Probably you can just write it down 
Proverbs chapter 12 verses 18 it says reckless words pierce like sword Proverbs 25 18 says a false accusation is like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow Psalms 143 words of poison it says and then on the positive side Proverbs 16 24 pleasant words are like honeycomb Proverbs 10 11 good words are like fountain of life so we need to be careful with our words daily brother. can we just close our eyes today there's several truths that we've seen here The first point that we saw was we need to respect people regardless of whether they are right or wrong because that's how God relates to you and me. He loved you and me. He valued you and me. Even when we were the worst of sinners, when we were not seeking Him, we were helpless, we chose our own way, we are living in lives of sin. He came for us. He died for us. He sent His Holy Spirit and His Holy Spirit came into your life making Christ real because He valued you, because He loved you. If we would have waited for us to earn His respect and do all the right things to reveal His love, it would have never happened daily, beloved. I just want you to go through your life and ask God to help you. If you've been wrong, ask God to forgive you. Regardless of who they are and what they've done, Lord, help me to honor people. The word of God says it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. When people are wrong, a lot of times we are not kind to them. We, we are angry with them and we speak a lot of things against them. We hurt them. But being kind, the Holy Spirit will work in people. A story just comes to my mind in the point that I just made. And I believe this is true. Tradition says that John was pastoring a lot of churches, John the disciple of Jesus. And there was this guy who was involved in a big gang, he was a big criminal. And John showed love to this guy. He loved him and he brought him into Christ. He had him as his own son and he mentored him and then when he had to go to another place he gave him to the bishop of that place and he said take care of him so after some time John returns back to find that the boy has gone back into his criminal ways he's worse than where he was before he's a gangster now one of the notorious gangs the moment John hears it he immediately asks for a horse and people tell him, no, you're old, don't ride the horse. He said, no, give me the horse, where are you going? I'm going into the deserts to meet the boy and they tell him, no, don't do that. They kill you, they're a bad group of criminals. But John says, no, I'm going. He takes the horse even though he's old and he goes into the deserts. And from the distance when the boy sees the horse coming, he goes to see who it is and he sees John from near. And the moment he sees John, he falls down crying. He asks forgiveness. The same day he comes back with John and God restores everything back.
in that boy's life. It was the love that John showed in that situation that brought that boy back. And it is love that changes people. 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 And we need to learn that. You and I are here because of God's love. We're not here by anything else because of God's great mercy and great grace and great love. And if we've walked angrily at people, hurting people out of a lack of love, ask God to help you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And let our prayer be, God, the words that I speak, I wanted to build people, God. The words that I speak, I wanted to encourage people, Lord. Ephesians says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which builds those who hear you and grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed under the day of redemption. When we speak words that hurt people, when we speak words that break people down, the word of God says it grieves the Holy Spirit. Father, tonight help us. We thank you. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts this evening. We pray that the love of God will be shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that whenever we correct people, we will do it with your perspective, with respect, with your love, O oh Father. And tonight I pray for all those who are hurting because of the destructive words that have been spoken over their lives. We ask for your healing power to touch them, O oh Father. Yes, we believe that there are people here tonight that are hurting, O oh Father. I just pray that you would heal the hurts, O oh Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, we cancel the power of destructive words that have been spoken over each of our lives, O oh Father. In the name of Jesus, set us free, O oh Father. You said, I have come to give life and life abundantly. You said, let not your heart be troubled. Pray for the peace of God that passeth all understanding to guard our hearts and minds. Help us to show the same grace that we have received from you to others, O oh Father. Father, we pray that you would pour out your love into our hearts. Bless your people tonight. Fill them with your love, peace and joy. Send them satisfied with your presence. May the lingering of presence of the Holy Spirit Always lead us and guide us. We give you all our worship and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the sweet and wonderful fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Please take some time to greet each other. Next week, uh, Reverend Daniel Dawson, we have a special speaker. So please invite your friends. God bless you. Please take some time to greet each other. Advice for them, what is that? That is also correction or between husband and wives, pastor, congregation. Every aspect you see that, you know, we come across situations where we need to correct people. And uh, the important point that I want to make here is, and that's what we are going to see uh, as we as the message proceeds when we bring correction within the biblical guidelines when we have the biblical guidelines as foundation and we bring correction in people then definitely God is going to work through that amen and that's what we're going to see for example if you take the example of David 
David was a powerful king. He had so many sons and daughters. And I want to highlight on three, three kids that he had. One was Ammon, another was Absalom and another was Tamar. Right, Tamar, the last one was David's daughter. And so what happens is during the course of life, one of the sons likes one of David's daughters and so he just basically rapes her. He does something really bad. Ammon rapes Tamar. So the word of God says in 2 Samuel 13, 21, if you can read that, 2 Samuel 13, 21, David hears about it. David hears what his son has done and look at David's reaction. But yet David does not do anything about it. And then after three years in exile, after three years of not seeing his son, because of some of the people around David, they bring his son back. And look at David's response to Samuel 14.24. We're looking at all of these things in the context of correcting and how important it is to correct uh, when people are wrong. 2 Samuel 14.24 After three years, his son is being brought back and look at David's response. Let him not see my face. Yes, that will do sister, yeah. So you see here, David hasn't seen his son, hasn't talked with his son for three years. His heart is longing for his son, so people around him, you know, uh, talk to him and bring his son. And the moment his son comes, what does he say? I don't want to see your face, get out. That's what he basically says. And for two years, two years, so it's totally five years now, David has not talked with his son. And do you know what happens during these five years? The enemy Yes, when David heard of all these things, he was very angry. He was wroth, the word of God says. That is the right word used there. So David was very angry with his son, but the word of God does not mention any action that David took. Basically, David was really angry with his son, but he did not do anything to correct him. Amen? So here, his son, he'd done something terribly wrong. David was very angry, and he, but you know, he, he didn't channel that anger properly. He didn't correct his son. And so what happens is the years go by. Tamar's brother, Absalom, is waiting for a chance. And so chance, he gets a chance and basically what he does is he ends up killing his own brother Ammon. And so this happens, you know, Absalom kills his own brother. And then what happens is he runs away. He runs away to another country. He lives with another king. And David for three years doesn't do anything about it. The word of God says, if you would continue reading those chapters, the word of God says, at one point, you know, David's heart starts longing for his son. Sanctify this place. Sanctify our hearts, God. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This message will be very useful for you. So if you're taking down notes, you can take down notes. Sometime back, I was just pondering on some things that were going on and uh, I was praying on those things and uh, out of it came this message. The title of my message is How to Bring Correction When People Are Wrong. It might be a different kind of a title but uh, it will be very, very helpful as we look into some truths from God's word regarding that. How to bring correction in people when they are wrong. Correcting is something that we do or come across in our everyday life, whether we know it or not, knowingly or unknowingly, we come across situations where we need to address things, we come across situations where we need to correct people, 
uh, when they are wrong and we are doing it without our knowledge or with our knowledge, we are always doing that. For example, if you are a father, parents and you have kids, I mean in a day probably you correct them twice or thrice or you know in the course of the week you know you would have corrected them several times. If you have friends and uh, one of your friends is doing something wrong, you have a piece of advice, let's close our eyes. Just ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you for this day and thank you, Lord, you're leading us into all truth. Your Holy Spirit is guiding us into all truth. We just want to thank you each day of our lives through your word, through what we hear and through what we see. You're always teaching us. And even now, Lord, as I share from your word that you will help us to understand and help us to walk according to your word, Lord. Just commit each one of us into your hands under the blood of Jesus. Lord, have your way in our lives. Have your way in our lives. Even now, have your way, Lord, that you will speak to each person at the point of their need, Father. Even though the words might be of a different topic, wherever they are, Father, whatever place in their lives might, they might be, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will touch them, Father. Just give you total control of this next few moments, God, till the end of this service, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will have total liberty to move, Lord. Just commit my thoughts and everything into your hands that you will grant me the grace to communicate clearly, Lord. We thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that was shed on the cross. We apply the blood of Jesus in this place, Lord. 